Thank you everyone who have uh, joined us at this very last session of the fifth annual ICWA Institute. If some of you joined our um, session prior with Justice Matoya Lewis, know that if you didn't, you need to, to just be with that session because she did such a fabulous job and continues to to inspire me to um, continue to tell my stories. And so um, it was very, very heartwarming. And so, so I think as Charlotte knows is that I can be a storyteller because she's done this presentation with me before. And some of you already know that I can get off, but so I will try and stay on track, no promises. Thank you, Ryan, for giving us this platform for the fifth year. And thank you for all the work that you did at the very beginning of this um, institute to, to build it to where it's at today. So I, I'm just very grateful to you, Ryan. And so with that, this is the pulling it all together. We're going to pull this whole week together and hopefully in a, in a good way to, to continue to inspire you to continue to you know, have those, those courageous conversations, to let you know that um, it's gonna be good. So with that, I will introduce myself and then I'm gonna pass it over to my friend Charlotte to introduce herself and then we'll, we'll move on. My name is Laura Lee Bentle and I come from the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation. I, I am a mother, I am a yaya, I'm a grandmother, auntie, sister, friend, and am very honored to, to stand with you today on this last day and have this platform to be with you all to kind of wrap it up in a, in a good way. I um, am honored to, to be here. I am honored to continue to have a voice and know that Lainey Green, who was going to be with us, had a family emergency, and she is from the Spokane Tribe of Indians and works for the Spokane County Advocate Program. I want to let you know that I'm not an expert, but I come to you during this session with knowledge and with with wisdom. I ended my career not too long ago. Well, I didn't end it. I'm still in it. <laughs> Go figure, right? But I'm, I'm honored to have been able to continue to speak for abused and neglected children in court. And so this is a starting point, another starting point for your journey. And so Charlotte, I'm going to turn this over to you so you may welcome and introduce yourself, my friend. Ochtechokia, everybody. Hello. Um, my name's Charlotte Penn, and I'm um, a Quileute tribal member, and I also work with the Quileute Tribal Court as the Victims of Crime Program Manager slash Advocate, and that's where the child advocacy plays in my role um, and my job duties. Um, I've been a foster parent for nearly 16 years. So that's where my passion is in child advocacy because we always want the best for our children. So um, I also am um, vice chair for our tribal school board. So I have a, a lot of roles for our students here on our reservation. And I also am a cultural liaison for our Forks School District where a lot of our children from the Pacific Northwest Coast go to school at. So. I'm a huge advocate for our children. And so, um, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for what you do for um, the world because this is not an easy job, um, being an advocate for our children in any role that you have. So thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. And I wanted to let you know too that um, Anne from Grace Harbor will take and monitor the chat for us during this session. So if you have questions, please put them in there. And Anne, go ahead if you think it's pertinent to bring them up and we'll do our best to um, answer them as, as it starts. 
So Ryan, we can go ahead and begin this PowerPoint. And um, once again, welcome, and we can go on to our next slide. And I really tried folks to try and do this thing and I just was <laughs> unable to, to, to maneuver it. And, and I'm okay with that today. So hopefully these are the five things that you will take away from this um, session and this week is to um, prepare and navigate an ICWA case, understand historic trauma, your role as an advocate in an ICWA case, understanding tribes have their own cult, own customs, tradition, languages, and, and how to help their children. And I, I'm hopeful that you'll continue to, to be a student and we'll go from there. And I'm going to um, let Charlotte to talk about the gold standard here. Next slide, Ryan, please. The gold standard. Um, well, Indian child welfare is um, something that I wasn't introduced to until I was an adult. So um, being, I've lived my whole life on a reservation. So I didn't know a lot of the struggles um, individuals that lived off reservation were until I was an adult. And um, that, um, so basically, you know, I had to take a crash course as an adult of how much our families and children struggled off reservation because on reservation, we have different struggles. Um, but as all um, families on reservation, we have a um, tight knit community. We don't like our children suffering and having to go somewhere else that does not involve family. So um, we try our best to keep our children in family homes In family homes, meaning you have some sort of connection, whether it's their teacher or their teacher's aide or whatever it may be, because they are part of our community, um, you know. So that's kind of what family means to me um, is being a part of the community. So um, that's kind of my take of the gold standard in my, you know, in, in my world. Thanks, Charlotte. And I, and I think that through this week, you've heard you know, the, the law piece and, and, and what Justice Matoya Lewis was talking about. So, so please um, know that you are a stand for the gold standard and, um, and just know that, that you're, you need to, to continue to, to learn and be there. We can go on, Ryan. So the provisions of the law, and this is what we talked about on our second day with Lori Irwin and um, Casey Looney, who are really great attorneys and have been with the ICWA Institute from the conception. And so, you know, we, we defined the active efforts and uh, reason to know aspect of it. And, and I think that those two pieces for me are, are really close because if those two pieces of the law are not followed, then, then our children will not have family to be with, have their community to, to be with. And, and, and the active efforts is going further than what the department normally does with reasonable efforts. And, and Charlotte is, has a, a advocate program on her tribe, um, tribal land. So they are able to, Charlotte, would you just maybe talk a little bit about the, the advocate program that, that the tribe has developed for, for your people and your children? Yeah, so um, about four or five years ago, 
the tribe um, started the Quileute Child Advocacy Program. Um, and we started with nothing and used the Washington Association of Child Advocacy Program very, um, my previous coworker, Naomi, actually started this program and she um, built it and now um, or as she's no longer with our program, but she, you know, built our child advocacy program for the Quileute tribe and it's still continuing to grow. Um, but I've been with it since it started and it's, it's, we, it's a huge process to get a child advocacy program, but the benefits of it having, um, as a resource for our children is like more than anything um, because you know our children they don't have a voice in the courtroom so the child advocacy program is a huge um, it's a huge part of the table now so and that's been so great that we have um, this program for our children and I just recently hired the new child advocate um, coordinator so she'll be um, probably in touch with um, Ryan and Laura Lee more often now because now I I pass the torch I am no longer the <laughs> the lead coordinator for that job um, I'm supposed to be just to be on the wall for it but I've been a huge role in the child advocacy program so that's where I stand now I, I think that's wonderful you have so much um, passion and knowledge behind um, the children um, Charlotte that I'm just really grateful that that you're here with us today. And, and, and I think that, you know, when we define the best interest of Indian child, you know, it's to protect the Indian children's um, safety, well being, and development, and, and have them, you know, in a stable, safe environment if they're unable to be home with a parent. But they also need to, to be able to um, have the department, you know, do things prior to a child is is taken out of the home to prevent that breakup of the Indian family and stuff. And so I think that with this week, those of you who attended all week have some great knowledge to 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 build on and and to be able to step into in, in helping Indian um, children and families and know that, and we'll talk about this later in the presentations, the, the differences between, you know, um, tribal communities. Um, so, <sighs> okay, we'll go on to our next slide and the judicial perspective. I am, Charlotte, I, I think that, you know, having Commissioner Ressa speak for the first time at our institute was something that was very powerful to to all of you who were able to to watch that and for those who ha didn't watch it i am just going to ask you to please um to watch it and not just once but more than once um she she came to the table in a very humble, genuine, authentic way and shared her, her knowledge with everyone. And, and I know that we will be asking her back because she is, to have that perspective from the bench really was something, um, I didn't realize we were really missing. And so with that, um, I would just ask you to, to continue to stand tall in the gold, the gold standard and keep that in the forefront of your minds because, because it is important. It is important to, to know the history of why this law was enacted back in 1978. Anything else, Charlotte, you want to maybe say? Okay. No. Okay. So we're going to move on to the boarding schools. And I know that you have heard a lot about this during 
during the week. And I know that there was a few times that, that I personally um, continue to, to have emotions around just knowing the history. And, and I think Justice Matoya Lewis gave a very good family perspective from her, her family. And I think that's where it's really important to remember that the boarding schools were the beginning of the demise of family ties, family ways of being. And um, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, Charlotte, do you- I unfortunately did not watch, I did not participate all week because, you know, I have a lot of job duties, but um, <laughs> just my perspective of the boarding school and the trauma and the history and stuff is um, even though it's now in the world spotlight spotlight as you know um, history for the world of boarding schools that stemmed from Canada and is now all over in the United States and we're still counting boarding schools um, in the United States but um, I just know personally that, you know, I've worked with the court system for more than 15, almost 16 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the judge would always talk to me about how can we help these adults and elders and people that have all of this trauma from, from their boarding school trauma, you know, because a lot of these um, elders still to date do not participate or talk about all those boarding school traumas and what they had to endure and all that other stuff. But how can we heal from that? And that's where um, that's where advocacy plays a huge role in it. You have to know the history and how can how and what can we research using our local resources on how to help these children and these families heal from all of this trauma even though these families you know they don't know the stem of alcoholism or the stem of um, drug addiction or neglect and all that other stuff because you know they don't know all of that history yet because they're still babies you know but we have all these resources in any of our local communities tribal communities um, that can share um, healing projects and healing classes, healing circles, um, education and all that good stuff that helps with historical trauma. And that's a big part of my role. That's a big part of my job duties is healing. So mm. how do we heal from this? And that's how we heal, you know, ceremonies, education, um, artwork is therapy, singing is therapy, you know, I can just go on and on and on, but that's, you know, that's a big part of my role here with my tribe is the healing from all of this trauma. So Charlotte, are you finding that more people on, that, that your people are beginning to, to understand that piece of their history? Yes, because we um, talk about it in schools now the door has now opened for educators um, of the community to come into our schools, to come into our homes to talk about all of this trauma and how we can heal for it. So we're not waiting for the families to get in trouble to help them heal. We're trying to prevent that from happening. So that's, that's what we've been doing, especially since COVID it's been, it was, you know, scary. It was scary as an advocate of all sorts of, you know, I'm not just a child advocate, I'm an advocate for a lot of things, but that was a big scare for us. So we had to, you know, come up with great plans and ideas. And so, you know, we made healing kits for each home on the reservation 
to help for our children and our adults and our elders, you know, all of that. So. Wow. Charlotte, that just, that enlivens me um, to hear what, what your tribe and your people are doing to begin that healing. It's been long coming. Yes. Long coming. So um, I'm just, <laughs> that, that is great. You know, I remember when um, I was doing a training one time in um, the Spokane area, and I was talking about the boarding schools and historic trauma and um, just some of those stories that, that I know of from, from my family. And I remember somebody saying to, to me, well, that happened so long ago. Why, why do you, why are you still in it pretty much? And um, I think, I think just, you know, knowing that, that, that collectiveness through, through families and through tribes and through people that it's just something. And I think just as Matoya Lewis mentioned it too, is that we're very, the very, private you know we're not out there you know telling our stories just because right yeah mm. wow that's really great to know so we'll go ahead and move on to um intergenerational trauma and you know the if you if you haven't looked up dr maria Yellow Horse Braveheart. She is a woman that continues to, to define historical trauma in a manner that I think is very powerful. And as you see up there, Charlotte, would you please read this? Because I always have a hard time with the um, that one word, commutative or whatever. From the beginning? um no or just what dr maria oh okay finds the middle one there thanks dr maria yellow Ho yellow horse braveheart defines historical trauma as cumulative cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over lifespan and across generations em emanating from massive group trauma yeah I know I always have a hard time with some words too, Charlotte. And, and I think that when, when we look at it, it has taken years to even begin to even talk about it. And we talked about the boarding schools and I know you mentioned Charlotte, you know, our first nations, our families, and our relatives above the border have found at their boarding schools just many, 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 many bodies of children. And I know that the United States has been looking into this also. And a lot of families didn't know what happened to their relatives, didn't know what happened to those children that were were, were taken. Yeah. And so, and I believe, you know, that's the beginning of, of healing too, is, is bringing our children home. And this, this gold standard law is really a beginning as well. So we can keep our children at home. And, and, you know, and we look at, you know, the skills embodied from trauma, you know, there's anger, there's avoidance, there's fear, guilt, you know, and to have, and I think you mentioned it too, Charlotte, you put together some healing um, things for your, for your families. I think that's beautiful. And can you, can you tell me what you put in those, those healing bags, you might say? Yeah, so we started, um, we came together as a community resource and we called ourselves the wellness, the wellness team. And so we use all these resources in our community. What we would have a theme each month, we did it only once a month. Um, we would have food 
and it would be like non-perishable food and we'd give instructions and provide the food for these families to cook together because a lot of families don't know because we were so busy working and working and working we would not have meals as a family together anymore so because of covid we were on um, stay at home orders like for a couple months we weren't allowed to leave our homes for um just for you know just we would only have to leave for um groceries or doctor's appointment or whatever it may be so coming from working all the time and not having that you know well what do we do now well so we provided these um kits it would had a culture component so i provided language and culture and so we would have like drum making kits and we would make a video on facebook or um, whatever it may be so they can um, learn how to make a drumstick or drum mm. um, a rattle or um, any kind of those things and then we would have like for um, some people don't know how to sit still and behave or just like not have nothing to do so we would provide um, like a weaving like make basket materials but modern day basket materials like with yarn or hemp or whatever it may be and teach them how to make a basket so their hands would always like be moving because that's how my family is they can't like not do nothing so we provided all those crossword puzzles were the biggest hit word searches um but we made our own word searches um just all these resources and um things and we provided um raffles for the ones that submitted their family photo of eating dinner together because not a lot of families eat to get dinner together anymore and not just in the living room or wherever it may be on the kitchen table so um anything like that and we did scavenger hunts hunts 5ks but virtually we you know we're not we're still not allowed to gather in groups we're still shut down from COVID. Like I'm working strictly from home. So we'll be having another uh, wellness kit in December um, because we know holidays are the highest rates for suicide and all the all depression and all the other stuff. So things like that, that we can help as service providers for our families. And one goes, one bag of those kits goes to every home on our reservation. Wow. You know, and, and just hearing some of those those services that that you provide to to the families, that's a lot of things that even our advocates could maybe think about. Yeah. 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 Huh. Hmm. That's awesome. Okay. Um we'll go ahead and move on to to our next slide. Can I ask a quick question on that real quick? Sure. Are those resources, you said mentioned something about videos on Facebook. Um, I'll share real quick. I am a foster parent of a native youth that is not a native home. So I'm here trying to figure out what I can do to support her, which in COVID has been very difficult. She says hi from the other side of the room, okay. um, but which in COVID has been extremely difficult. Are those resources something that like other people could access no um you would have to be a um well not from our tribe our mm -hmm. tribe is um you have to be either a community member or say you were a foster home for one of our tribal members then yes something our service provider would be able to do that but a lot of other tribes um in washington state have done the same thing they've hosted their own like um, cedar weaving bandanas and they did basket weaving the other day. Um, it really depends on which tribe your child is from. That's what um, services you can find. And a lot of those services, they posted on Facebook of what. So you have to get involved in, um, you know, like be a good detective on Facebook and find all these, um, pages because there's a lot of Facebook pages that all these tribes and community um, coalitions um, 
post and everything is always on Facebook. And if they're not, somebody knows something. <laughs> okay. That's cool. I just was like, ooh, if those resources are already there and on Facebook, can I tap in? All right, thank you. Yeah. And, and I think Charlotte made a good point that, that each tribe has a, a website. Each tribe is, is able to, you know, you can bring forth, you know, information from that tribe just being on Facebook or the websites and finding different avenues that way yeah that's great thank you for that question um, and thank you for being a foster parent to an Indian child and wanting to keep that culture still alive in in her so our next slide is is just a, a, a remember you know we're, we're just we just need to remember that the abuses um, which led to the passage of ICWA, and I think my person who is supposed to be moving the slides may be having a challenge, <laughs> and that's okay because we're just going to continue on. Thanks, Ryan. So these, these abuses happened to real people. They continue to happen to real people. And this is, is a role that you can help begin to, to heal. So just know that through your work, and I believe it was talked about yesterday with the Nair and the Lickwack, that how you can be helpful in finding relatives and asking those questions. And I know that Ryan has some great ideas that he's going to, to bring forth in working with um, Nair and some other programs to, to, to be able to help our advocates know that you as those voices can ask questions about family members, obtain phone numbers, um, continue to, to make phone calls to family members and, and gathering that information. So it's really, it's, it's, it's really um, an important piece, I believe, for our child advocates to, to continue to foster within themselves and, and to know that your program is um, there to support you. I know for myself, I will continue to stand in, in this, this field of, of education, in the field of, of assistance, in the field of being able to, to continue to to not shy away from those conversations of, of being able to tell the truth of the matter. So anything, Charlotte, you wanted to say about this particular slide? Yeah, um, we just got a question in the, in the chat. Okay. And I was gonna actually touch on that a lot. Um, it takes a long time to get trust from your parents that you're um, for the child that you're advocating for, even you know, as a tribal member and as somebody that's lived in our community almost her whole life, because of the loss of trust issues from historical trauma and intergenerational trauma, it's been very difficult as well because like, oh, you're part of the court. I don't want to talk to you. You know what I mean? Or I don't want to tell you that something like this, or just, it's going to be really hard to get that trust. Um, just stay consistent on meeting your families, not on a schedule, just randomly, but not forgetting. Don't forget, even if it's going to, even if their families are going to be put a push back a lot because they will push back because you know all that trust is it's really it's really really hard 
like, oh, I'm not going to trust, it. you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, you just have to come, come across straight and saying, you know, hey, we're on the same team here. We're working for your child. We're your child's voice. So I want you to be consistent on being that trustworthy person in that child's life with their parents, with the caseworker, with the um, counselors, with the school teachers, and showing them not necessarily a lot of compassion, but being present. So um, one of my things I was going to talk about was like, how do you do that? Well, because of COVID, it's a really difficult to go to an event and show your presence as a community member, because they're going to trust you as a community member, knowing that you're there or a baseball game or something or rather, because you want to witness how, you know, these families are in different settings, because that's kind of what you have to do. But just being present, being available and being very consistent. Thanks, Charlotte. And, 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 and that trust is, is big and there's reasons behind the, the trust issue for sure. Thank you for that. Good question. So we're going to um, just move on to the active efforts versus reasonable efforts one more time because I do not believe we can talk about this enough. <laughs> it's, 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 it's something that, um, that is most important. So, and, and I know you've heard it this week. And um, so I think we need to think globally when we're, when we're with a family and knowing that, act, that they, they are an Indian family. Because if you look, you know, reasonable efforts are just, you know, the social worker is going to make a referral, you know, they're going to manage a case and they have to meet minimum standards, you know, policy standards, and they do mainstream services for, for families. And, um, and a lot of times, and, and it's been my experience, they're not always if a tribe is involved and or has intervened, they have not always kept that um, tribal representative updated on a regular basis. And, and that's really important. And Charlotte, if you don't mind, I'm gonna have a sip of water. And if you wanna talk about the other side of this column, I greatly appreciate that. <clears throat> um, so active efforts. Um, we're severely active on our active part because we know as, you know, a lot of people do not like to call for help. So even though that you refer your parents or your guardians or grandparents, whoever it is that was in charge of the child, that the child is now moved on to a different home, but you're still going to try to reconcile that relationship wherever and whoever they're with. So arranging services like is a huge, huge part of our referral process. We're not just gonna say, oh, well, you need to go to this building and you need to talk to um, Laura Lee. Well, we're gonna call Laura Lee and we're gonna sit there and arrange those services and transportations even though that's like, but we're, we're really different than outside agencies. So we're really trying to do our best um, to help these families and this children or whatever it may be. But the caseworkers for Indian Child Welfare at our building, the social workers also do that. So they have this double whammy of active efforts, mm -hmm. if I make sense. Yes, you do. So don't you think too is that, I mean, do you have, cause I know that you're really close to a county program. Do you automatically take the children from your tribe into the tribal court? 
No, that takes a while. We have our ICW attorney that represents the tribe in um, the local county court. And um, I don't know how they take it to um, move to tribal court, but it's, it's a process. It takes mm -hmm. some time and sometimes the state won't allow it depending on which case it is or which cases and families there are. Um, but right now, I think because the caseload is so high, um, our caseworkers are only taking a very emergency right now. Yeah, yeah. And COVID has had a huge impact on that, so. Mm. Mm. So do you, with the active efforts, if they have to follow ICWA, do you see that occurring? Um, with the outside agency? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, kind of. I want to say kind of. Um, be, our, our, our local agency is in like in Port Angeles. That's the nearest one. And that's kind of far from us. So we don't have a lot of Kaliute programs because that's another tribal territory. So they've been using those tribal resources as the culturally appropriate services, um, which is okay, but it's not Quileute. Right. It's another tribe. So that's been really hard, but because of COVID, we can't be like, well, they need to come here and participate in our tribal events and stuff like that. So, so an advocate could really be able to, to help out in many ways there, right? To make sure. Yeah. Yeah. We can suggest resources and invite them to closed events where there's a certain amount of number, which we've only had one. We had a culture fair um, just for children in the foster system. And we called that um, our first annual culture fair. But because of COVID, we only got to have one at the beginning of the summer and then we got shut down. So yeah. I know this COVID thing really has put a, a hardship on so many people. So, so yeah. we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, Nair and Liquac. And for some of, you, we just had this yesterday with um, Heidi Walker, who is the NAIR, the Native American Inquiry. Actually, it should be referral instead of request, um, who is the program director for the, for the state of Washington, making sure that those um, inquiries are able to get out. And I thought she did a pretty fabulous job in explaining what they do and possibly on, on how you can help. And then on LICWAC, the Local Indian Child Welfare Advisory Committee, we had Billy Patterson from the Yakima Nation who was able to share some really beautiful family pictures that, and to explain um, how you as advocates can be a part of those, those meetings and to be able to put those recommendations in your court reports and and to help you know the your, the Indian children that you're going to be speaking for so just know that those two things are, are really important so so now we're going to um, touch upon um, understanding the relational worldview which can be it can be complicated in many ways but just know that There is um, some articles and presentations that you can find on YouTube and um, under NICWA, which is the, the Native American um, program that is out of Portland. And Terry Cross wrote a really beautiful article regarding the relational worldview versus the, um, the linear worldview. 
And I like to, you know, give, you know, share with you that the linear worldview is really about cause and effect. You know, how we think about that. You know, if you have this cause of child abuse and neglect, and the effect is that we take the children and we, we try, we, and that's what we do, right? And we try to find the problem, we fix the problem. And, and I, I have to tell you, I have a, a dear friend who um, I call my linear friend because, you know, in through her work and in through her, her education of herself, you know, she sees where, you know, that part of her and, and she is just, um, just a really amazing woman that, that I highly respect. And the relational worldview is, is more fluid. It's, 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 you know, using that intuitive piece that, that I believe we all have and it's balance and harmony in, in all our relationships. And, um, and it's, and it's a vent that um, is, it doesn't matter about time or space or physical conditions, you know, the existence of that. It's just, it brings together, I want to say the, the, the medicine wheel, you might say, you know, and um, if we can move on to the next piece here, Ryan, um, it talks about, and, and Charlotte, you can help me here too. Um, you know, we have the medicine wheel in, in my eyes, you know, we have the content or the context, we have a spirit, we have mind and we have body here, you know, and um, Charlotte, if you want to maybe go ahead and, and, and talk a little bit about these, I, I would greatly appreciate that. And yeah, um, so on the, the linear point of view is like, well, it shows, you know, like the children are taken away because of neglect. So we're going to add the parenting classes component and it's going to be court ordered. Well, why that if you don't know why they were being neglectful? So um, in our wellness court, our tribal wellness court, we have this component of wellness of the body inside and outside. So how are we going to help this client get back to being we can never be the same before trauma um, or after trauma. We can never be the same person we were before trauma. So how are we going to help these people and help these families? We're going to suggest, you know, drum group. We have drum group healing circle every Wednesday, but because of COVID. Anyways, so we're going to help them um, and give them suggestions of like, you need to go back to what your grandmother used to practice and how she used to help you deal with those things. And so like would my grandmother, what, would, what did she used to help me with? Well, she used to teach me how to cut wood for the smokehouse to smoke, smoke salmon or elk or deer or um, whatever else seal everything anything else that went into the smokehouse and why why did she do that well that was bonding time for her and her grandchild to talk about family to talk about culture to talk the talk about the importance of your work ethics if my sister is going to yell at me at work I'm not going to be able to act like I do at home I'm going to have to act professional and um community history that's a good part of history and so that teaches teaches so much just it's the smell your smelling brings back memory and feeling the touch touching the water also brings back those memories so all the senses smelling hearing um touching tasting um is a huge component of all these things that are in the circle because it's bringing back the nutrition. It's bringing back emotions, memory, experience, you know, all these things. And during those times also shares stories and stories in our history comes with songs mm -hmm. and um, teachings and dancing because you can't just sing and not dance, you know, or something like that. And in our world, in my world here that I am in, that's how 
we suggest things to these families and to these individuals that, you know, are missing that small component of wellness. It really is wellness because wellness includes the inside and the outside part of the body. Mm. Wow. Thank you for that, Charlotte. And, and it reminds me of a story, um, a dear friend of mine um, who, who used to help in, in doing um, presentations um, on the spirit of ICWA and, and, and it, Charlotte, you just, you said it so beautifully, but it reminded me of what Buffy would say about helping an Indian mom. They had outlined all these, you know, cookie cutter um, services for her and she was not doing well, but I think Buffy, you know, picked up on some of the things that that was being a challenge for her. And she talked to this mother about what she, what did the mother believe she could do to, to be able to help, you know, herself and her family and, and through the healing pieces. And this mother wanted to go do, you know, sweats. This mother wanted to be with, you know, traditional healers and not do these, you know, services that the, the court had ordered. And, and my friend just fought really hard for this to happen for that mother. And she was able to convince the court what this mother truly needed. She needed this relational world um, view of, of healing. And that's what she did. And, and, and I believe the mother was able to heal and be able to, to get her children back and to be able to be a whole person where it hit all those quadrants of herself. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Thank you for that. So we're going to go ahead and, and move on to um, a topic that I think is really important. And I think um, Charlotte um, touched upon this a little bit, and that is um, building, building relationships, building effective relationships. And um, this is where we move into that piece of trust that Charlotte talked about. And and on the next slide, you know, we have some, some things that, that I just want to be able to bring forth and, and say, and, and Charlotte, go ahead and jump in anytime because I know that this is, is pretty close to your heart too as Indian women is that relationship building is far bigger than um, sometimes people will really realize is, is just introducing yourself, not your role, but who you are. And I believe Justice Matoya Lewis shared that as well. You know, we, we come from our people and um, how can we help you and the, the children? And, 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 I, and I've seen this over the years about, you know, People, you know, going in there, you know, I'm an advocate and I got my little clipboard and I'm going to, you know, go in there and, you know, take, you know, information. Um, but you have to be very cautious in that manner. Yes. Yeah. The and only time I bring a clipboard is for court. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And, 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 you know, and, and it's don't make agreements you can't keep. That is really difficult because when you are talking with your child there, when you ask them, is there anything you would like us to tell the judge? What is it something that you would like to share to, you know, in court or whatever it may be, you know, as an advocate. And a lot of the times is I want to go back with my mom or I want to go back with my dad. And that's like so heart wrenching. You can't, that's the biggest time you need to not make a promise or 
you have to be very careful on when you speak to them after they ask that question, because that's going to be your make or break with that child. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, throughout our history, we've had broken promises from, from governments, from, from, you know, the, you know, that whole piece there. And, and I think that that's huge building that trust and, you know, and just go in there being yourself. Don't mm -hmm. try and, and be somebody who you're not and, and, and know that, that you come to the table with, with biases. You come to the table with, with a, um, a maybe a perception of what an Indian family is from movies, from books that you learned in school, or even, you know, when, when people say, you know, um, you know, they just late because it's Indian time, right? There's reasons that's pretty derogatory in my book because grandma told me about Indian time and um, Indian giver. We are givers. <laughs> we are truly givers, right? Yes. And um, I have a, um, a quick story that there was a, a gentleman up in uh, Barrel, Alaska, and this was many years ago that I had been afforded two of his children to speak for. And every month I would call him and every month I would mark off a good hour on my calendar. Cause it just wasn't about talking about their children but it was talking about our lives, his world, my world, and in between stories and, 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 and listening and, and being able to build that relationship, we had great outcome for his children. Every month, an hour, sometimes it would go more, and I was okay with that. So patience sometimes in building. So, and there are times where it's going to take a while to um, be accepted, to be accepted into um, the world here. So if we move on to our next slide. Ah, respect. My friend, do you want to talk about respect? Yeah, um, so listening is a huge part of the whole respect word. Um, if they're telling a story or if they're sharing, you know, about their day or whatever it may be, um, don't talk back, don't add your, don't add your, um, don't add your two cents, just listen until they're fully done talking um, because that will be taken very um, wrong and they won't share with you anymore. Um, I don't ever dress up. <laughs> My dress up is earrings. Um, I don't even dress up for court because every courtroom is different. We're just not allowed to wear like ripped jeans or whatever it may be. So know your courtroom that you're going to so you know the proper etiquette. Um, ours, if you dress too formal, we're not gonna trust you. Um, even our judges, you know, they don't wear the whole tie and suit ordeal because, you know, they have to wear their robe. So um, they're not, they're some, you know, sometimes our judge, judges come in in their um, hunting gear. <laughs> <laughs> because you know we're hunters here we, that's how right now is hunting season I don't think we have court until December actually um so a lot of Indian families if you're um on their side of the team they're gonna gift you with a gift or you know they're gonna thank you 
and refusing those gifts is a huge disrespect. You don't want to lose that uh, disrespect. You can kindly take it and say thank you very much. And if you don't want to keep it, you can donate it to your organization for a raffle or for um, you can donate it to your friends that you think will like it, um, whatever it may be, but also the invitations like, you know, a lot of our families invite you to a soccer game or um, let's just act like there's COVID not involved right now. So um, drum circle every Wednesday, or if we have a school player event, which we used to have a lot elders week or whatever it may be these children that you're forming that relationship with are going to invite you to these events because they're going to have a role in that event um, you don't have to go to all but if you show your face to one even if it's for five minutes and they see your face you know that's a huge a huge um that's a huge quality that they're going to see in you when you do um show up to an event you know what I mean but don't plan your life around going to an event I'm just saying be a part of the community so that they know and see you and I know it's different out out in the real world this is just my world but um that's just a little bit of my my view on all of this mm -hmm. I think it's 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 great and I and I and I love what you bring to the table, my friend. And um, um, and I think on the next slide, we we really touched upon, and I know Charlotte has expanded upon the, the actions that can really um, erode tr trust, you know? And, and one more time, you know, we talk about personal biases. And, and I think, was it Wednesday during, just, during uh, Ressa, um, Commissioner Ressa's uh, presentation, uh, Ryan put in the chat a a study or or a, a bias, you know, um, what's the word test that you can take to see where where you stand. And and I have to let you know that that I come to the table with with biases because I am human. But today I try not to to have them be an active part of who I am today, but I am aware of them. And um, I think it's really important to, to always consult with, with family members, with um, anybody who is involved with the child's life. And um, that's really important, so. And I think we can probably uh, move on because I think we I think you got the idea about what trust is is and, and what it can do. And so here we're just going to help you. Well, not help you, but um, kind of define your role as an advocate in ICWA cases. And if you're blessed enough to even be um, having a case that is in tribal court, this will helpfully, hopefully give you some ideas. And, and this comes straight out of the trainings that, that Ryan does, that, that I believe your programs stand in. And I do know that um, a lot of the, the, the tribal programs, and we'll, we'll touch upon those in just a little bit. But so the next role is, I mean, or the next slide, I should say, is is what I like to call GFAM, and and you probably have heard these, and that's you know gather information. You're going to facilitate, advocate, advocate, and monitor these cases. So with that, with the next um, few slides, we're going to go through each one of these and just give a a quick quick view. And Miss Charlotte. I'm going to put you on. <clears throat> okay, um, so gathering information. Um, so you're going to know and study your child's case once you get it. You're going to see which active efforts the caseworker 
has done for the family, but your part is for the child. So you want to see, COVID really sucks because it makes a lot of the being, um, making sure the children has the right resources for community involvement with culture, their inherent right. So if they're off reservation, they don't have a lot of resources for that. But if you find the right person that has connection, which the caseworker should, they should know um, what resources their tribal facility has to gather that information. But first and foremost, we have to be that detective. We have to figure out where this child comes from and um, look on their websites and whatever it may be and make those active efforts of how are we going to give because you know we don't want to cause a problem we're going to say well there's not a lot of culture install installed in this case well we have to come up with a plan as well as starting that problem so we want to make we want to bring something to the table instead of bringing the problem to the table so that's where our detective work comes in um finding those resources and reaching out to a family member that that child's involved with, well, well, how can I get a hold of these resources for the child that is in care? And, you know, a lot of the times they'll help. A lot of the times they'll help with this, you know, the child in care to um, get those resources placed. I love that. Be a detective. That's good. Yes. Throw your bat. I'm a detective. Okay. And so I know. So the next one is, is facilitate. And, and I think, you know, that is just remembering, you know, we, we, we seek cooperation. We, we try and, and, and Charlotte mentioned that you don't bring the problem to the table. We try and facilitate the solutions of, of the case, you know, and, and we, and we, you, you gotta be, no, you don't gotta be, it is very, important to be able to be firm about your stand in ICWA, about your stand in building relationships, in your stand to, to you know, have reason to know and, and finding those active efforts, you know, in, in, in the cases that, um, that you're going to be involved with. So, you know, um, we have a definition of an Indian child is is an unmarried person under the age of 18. And so that's where, you know, we need to stand and, and continue to to move forward. And and I know that we talked about jurisdiction where a, a tribe will take the case. And and I know Charlotte's um, tribe can take jurisdiction of, of a of a of one of their children at any time, okay. and um, I think it's important to be able to to know that and be respectful of that, and um, and not fight it because there's reasons, you know, we they that they do that, and then and then a and then a tribe can you know do intervene, and that is you know that that tribe is a party to the case, they have every right as anybody to be notified of hearings, to be notified of, of staffings, and to be able to be at the table at all times. So, so that's, that's that. And the advocate, <clears throat> Miss Charlotte, <laughs> my throat is really dry. Identifying an advocate for the best interest of the Indian child well in a lot of places they have a lot of advocates and I'm really jealous of that because here there's only me and my um QCAP coordinator <laughs> so um I have to conflict myself out of a lot of cases because well I'm kind of really related to almost everybody that is in our caseload but I know how to be very professional and I know how to, you know, advocate for that child properly. So 
Um, but there are some cases that I have to take myself out of that, but I can still be involved like at the table for suggestions and stuff like that. But so this part like is really easy for me. <laughs> um, which advocate is going to be best for these children? It's either me or her. So um, one way or other, they most likely will be with me. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. So it's just always being there, right? Being, being that child's voice, no matter what. Yep. You know? And, you know, the tribal wishes are very big role on us. So, you know, we do um, talk to neighboring um, advocates on how they can, you know, share our tribal cultures, cultural um, practices and things like that. But because of COVID, it's just too hard. So we have language apps and language programs online where mm -hmm. we can, you know, share some of that stuff with but um, it's, it's, it's not the same as in person, Yeah. but that's the best we can do right now. Yeah, good deal. And so the, the next slide is monitor. And I think you all really understand that piece. You know, we have some other slides that I really want to try and get to um, because I just noticed the time and I want to make sure that we have um, the time that's needed to, to finish up this presentation in a, in a good way. So you know that that you monitor the case in, in a good way, making sure that referrals and um, things are are continually to be made for, for the family and, and for the child and stuff. So um, the next slide is, is about what you should know as an advocate. And I think, you know, through through our presentation, I think, and through this week, I think that um, you really probably have a, a good, good idea of, of what you need to know. And there was on the next slide, I have, um, yeah, this is everything you've heard. So Ms. Charlotte, if you have anything, yeah, this is the one I love, know what you don't know. You know, I, I love this, I heard this when I was, working um, with the Kalispell Tribe of Indians as their program manager, as um, and when I helped them implement their tribal program and a wise, a wise judicial officer for the tribe, uh, Tom Tremaine, who um, would always say, know what you don't know. And, and that, that has always stuck with me. So know what you don't know until you know it. So you move and you continue to seek the knowledge for yourself. So this next part is, is where I really wanted to um, try and get to is the tribal cultural um, differences. And um, I know that Charlotte has shared some of her, her cultural differences and, and know that um, so Charlotte, are all tribes the same? <laughs> Not at all. Um, I wanted to, you know, you've heard about our, um, so our, we're, we're deemed as Clallam County, but we're not really Clallam County. We're the Quileute tribe and we have our own um, judicial court in our own police. Um, so, um, other Clallam County facilities um, have are on different tribal land. That's a big difference of sharing um, our culture, traditions, and everything else, whatever it may be, because um, like any other courtroom, they're all different. The judges are all different. It's just the same with our tribal communities, even though it's an hour down the road we still have many different cultural differences and practices and names. Um, it's a big difference. Like, you know, um, like any other person, it may mean something different than what it is mean to, meant to me. So you just have to know, 
you know, always be a student and always, you know, if you don't know, ask. Um, that's the best communication is the key. So I think that's the biggest thing I like to say. Like, if you don't know, ask, communicate it. Because if I don't know that's what you meant, then it's going to be a whole nother story. So, so, you know, for, for my tribe, we have powwows and ceremonial um, name givings and um, rites of passage. And does your tribe do um, powwows? We don't do powwows. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think sometimes, you know, I have sat in Likwak and people will say, well, I'll just take them to a powwow. Yeah, we've gotten that a few times, you know, our families, not all of our families are on a reservation. Some are in the city and they're like, oh, yeah, we went to this powwow. And well, that that's not what our community practices are. We don't mm -hmm. do powwows. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So is there like a potlatch, a giveaway? We do we do ceremonies like the coming the coming of the whale ceremony. So mm -hmm. we do seasons. We don't do big um big gatherings like like a powwow would be, but um ours are seasonal ceremonies. And we do give giveaways. We do uh, we do host um, canoe journeys, but not all tribal Northwest Coast tribes do participate in canoe journeys, and not all families participate in canoe journeys. So, you know, we all have to be uh, mindful of all of that as well, because you know there's family differences and practices. So you have to know the families in the tribe um, what practices they do so you can't court order somebody to participate in canoe journeys and they know nothing about it because mm. their family does not participate in that cultural event mm. yeah so we have to be very mindful of what family does this and what family does that so so it's really important y'all to really you know understand not only the sovereignty of a tribe but the cultural you know differences so and as charlotte said ask the question don't be afraid to ask the question so thanks so the next slide is just a slide of the different reservations and this was talked about um a little bit yesterday of the federally recognized tribes here in the state of washington and and i'm honored to 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 tell you that our state has five five tribal programs. We have the Spokane Tribe of Indians who has an advocate program. We have the Yakima Nation that has a, a tribal program, the Kalispell Tribe. And see that, that little bitty piece up there? That's what the government gave the Kalispell people. Go figure, eh? I'm telling you. But they're a very powerful um, force in the community, not only in Ponderé, but as in the um, Spokane County. So I was honored to be a part of them. And then we have Charlotte's tribe, the Quileute tribe, and then Port Gamble Scollum also has a tribal program. And um, my goal and my vision is to continue to help and support not only these five, but to continue to have conversations with other tribes to help them you know, know of the resources that they can do for um, their their tribe and stuff. So I think that is it. And um, we come to our next slide and it is a um, talking circle. So this is an opportunity. We have a few minutes before, you know, we move on to the finale of, of this session and, um, <laughs> I'm really amazed, Charlotte, that, you know, we got through this and it's almost time to, you know, call it a day. Wow. So any questions? <laughs> so I, I have a question here in the chat from Nancy Fisher Allison. I think it goes back to what Charlotte was saying about, um, you know, you 
you you call for the client or the the family to to organize or to to get them somewhere. But um, Nancy says a frustrating factor for GALs is that we're not allowed to provide transportation, even if we'd like to. So our only option is to press the social workers to do something about accessibility or perhaps try to connect the parents with family and friends. How how can we do how can we do that without violating everyone's sense of privacy? Um so um, what we do here, if we know something is going to come up, we're going to sit down and have a family meeting. And a family meeting to me is like, we're going to talk with uh, the caseworkers and we're going to talk about which event is coming up. And um, we would clearly like the families to be all in this, but knowing the caseworkers, they're going to be really busy. So how can we get these individuals to this location. Um, we find gas money, gas vouchers. We find a licensed driver. We find a clear background licensed driver, I should say, and insurance. And if we can't, most likely 96% of the time, we can find an individual in the family that we can get a hold of to bring these children to this location for whatever it is. Um, so if we know ahead of time, we can make those plans and resources. Um, and, um, and if not, we can ask the caseworker how they can get them there or pick them up so we can get a ride for them there, but they can't bring them back. So we're gonna ask them, well, can you pick them up and bring them back home? So if that doesn't happen, then we're just SOL and a lot of the times, or maybe one out of the few times, you know, we don't have enough resources to get that, those families, you know, to the location and back. That's usually what we do. You know, we powwow. We powwow. <laughs> okay, let's do it, huh? <laughs> I remember that, that reminds me, I remember sitting in a meeting with um, the county I worked for and somebody said that and, and um, people said that my leg was just a bouncing up and down, you know, and, and, and coming from you, Charlotte, it doesn't bother me, but coming from, you know, the, the people in this meeting, um, I had to explain to them what a powwow was, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I love that, you know, and I think, you know, um, as advocates, um, it's a social worker's job to find those resources and how can you help them, you know, find those relatives or find a family friend or find somebody to help yeah. bring people together, right? Yeah, so actually in one of those wellness kits that we deliver to the homes, um, our last QCAP coordinator arranged a family tree session because a lot of the times these, um, child um, caseworkers um, don't know the full family tree because tribes don't have the access to how the state. So every, every year I get multiple letters from the state saying, we matched you in the system and noticed that you're a relative to so-and-so mm -hmm. and so-and-so. -and -so. Well, tribes, we don't have that um, process or um whatever it's called, to send a letter out to me saying, you're a match to this family, will you be able to take this child? Well, our child advocate um, provided um, um, a family tree session and paperwork and stuff like that to challenge all these families to put together as much as they know in their family tree and submit it back to our social services building and our child advocacy program so we can all come together and share that resource. Well, so-and-so we know has, you know, it's usually by word of mouth as um, service providers to say, well, Jane Doe has a license and insurance and I know she would be willing to help so-and-so. So just call them up and say, name drop, you know? So mm -hmm. that, that's like, that's a huge thing is knowing the family tree and um, you got to know, like you got to know how to access. And it's so easy for us because there's barely, you know, we're one square mile of a reservation. So, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have a whole 
thousands of people to com com you know, commute with or whatever it may be. So, yeah. I really love that idea about the, the family tree, you know, to, to get names and numbers. And um, we're, we're getting close. So before I show this, um, or before Ryan puts it on the screen, I, Charlotte, I just want to thank you from my heart that, um, that you agreed to, to participate in this. And um, I'm honored to, to call you my friend and my sister today um, and, and stand with you, um, to Paul, to continue to work in our um, communities the way we do. And I'm going to end with um, just something that Wilma Mankiller told me. Um, she had a story about the difference between a cow and a buffalo. And, um, you know, cows, cows will run away from a storm. They will run like crazy from this, this storm. And Charlotte had a good one earlier. <laughs> in her area um, but a buffalo a buffalo will run towards the storm so please be a buffalo continue to run towards the storm because that's what we're in most of the time we're in a storm of a bureaucracy we're in the storm of making sure families heal so please be that buffalo and um, Charlotte, I'm gonna give you a, a minute to, if you wanna say anything towards this end before we end with this video. No, I don't have anything to say other than thank you for having me. And thank you everybody for doing what you do. Keep on keeping on. Ooh, I like that. So with that, um, after this video, we're just gonna close the session of the the last day of this Institute and hope to see you again because we will continue this institute into the future. So thank you, Lemlets. Ryan, if you wanna show this really wonderful video and please listen and take it to heart, my honor. One morning I woke up and I heard my brother crying he was screaming so loud, you thought someone was dying. Mom, Dad, he screamed, but there was no use trying. They weren't around. I ran outside and saw he'd had a pretty bad crash. His bike was in the ditch, down his arm a bloody gash. He looked so pitiful just sitting there in the dirt amongst the trash crying. I want Mom and Dad. I picked him up and started running toward my uncle's up the way. It started raining and got real dark. He could barely tell it was day. My brother cried and asked, Sister, where's mom? I didn't know what to say when the truth is, I don't know. When my uncle saw us coming, he ran into the yard. He took my brother from me and he held him in his arms. When he saw my face, I could tell. I could tell he was alarmed. And he said, what happened? Did you fall too? Uncle, I'm so tired, so tired of wondering why. Why do they drink? Why do they do drugs? Why do they leave us? Why? He said, sister, it's hard to explain. And I said, uncle, try. And then he told this story. Once this land was teepees, as far as you can see. The water was clean, the land pristine. We were where we were meant to be. Then strangers came across the sea and brought with them their disease. Our people cried and prayed and sang, but it brought them to their knees. Imagine that your family, and most of all your tribe, 
What if most of everyone you love suddenly got sick and died? And before you even had a chance to bury them and mourn, the strangers came and took away the land where you were born. And you wondered if your parents even cared as they stole you and your brother away, or if they'd been so beaten down they had nothing left to say. And then at school, they cut your hair and beat you if you spoke. The language that Creator gave our people when Earth awoke. Sister, I'm not trying to tell you that your mom and dad are okay, or that they are not responsible for the choices that they've made. But you see this bloody wound on your little brother's arm. If we don't clean it, it won't heal and it'll do all kinds of harm. Those deep wounds of our ancestors still bleed within our hearts. When we remember all they've done, that's where the healing starts. So every morning when you wake, you pray this prayer out loud. Creator, help me live in a way that would make my ancestors proud. We will rise up from the darkness. Don't you forget this. You can be anything you want to be. We will overcome the pain. Just work hard. Never give up. Perseverance is the key. For your spirits live within. Strength, dignity. Honor, that's all in your family tree, so hold your head up high and know that. Thank you everyone. Laura Lee, I just want to tell you, thank you so much for opening your heart and giving of your spirit to this institute and to our Native American families and to our advocates. Uh, you've continued to do this year after year and your heart is still strong and I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that your circle of connection you bring forward to others so that we can learn. And the speakers we've had have just been tremendous and wonderful. And so with my heart, I say thank you. And that also goes out to Ryan, because I know what a big part he plays in being able to provide this for everyone. So thank you so much, Laura Lee and Ryan and all of our speakers that have joined us throughout this week. And thank you advocates for being present. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Y'all yes, have- Yes, Laura Lee, thank you for roping me in. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's because I love you, my friend. Just because you're, you're right there. So thank you, thank you for- giving of yourself. Bye y'all. Be Take well. Care.